Today's episode of Hidden Forces is made possible by listeners like you. For more information about this week's episode or for easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you listen to the show on your Apple Podcast app, remember, you can give us a review. Each review helps more people find the show and join our amazing community. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. What's up, everybody? I am very excited to share this week's episode with all of you. My guest, Matt Taibbi, truly needs no introduction. He is someone whose work I've long admired and whose polemical but also highly illustrative and expository commentary has had an important influence on my own development as a writer and his contribution to the public debate during the 2008 financial crisis cannot be understated. He served as an interpreter for what was, in his own words, a crime story that most people mistakenly thought of as an economic story. His attacks on those he identified as being chiefly responsible for the crisis were relentless, and in a media environment tenanted and owned by government apologists and banking sycophants, they were noticeably ruthless and unforgiving. In an article he penned in the spring of 2010 titled The Great American Bubble Machine, Taibbi referred to the investment bank Goldman Sachs as a, quote, great vampire squid wrapped around the face of humanity, relentlessly jamming its blood funnel into anything that smells like money. Fortunately for Goldman, Matt since turned his attention towards the media itself, embarking on an ambitious project to update Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky's Manufacturing Consent for the 21st Century as a serialized book that he's been releasing through Substack. The majority of this conversation deals with the subject of that book, which is a sort of operational manual for those looking to understand how journalists and the media shape social reality. When Manufacturing Consent was first published in 1988, The media landscape was still largely dominated by print and broadcast television. We've gone through two major technological disruptions since, first with cable and now with the internet. So I wanted to use this opportunity with Matt to discuss how these changes have altered the traditional pathways through which governments and big business try to shape and control public opinion. Finally, For those of you who are subscribers to our overtime segments, Matt and I discuss the circus that is the media's political coverage, including some amazing stories from his time on the 2016 campaign trail, as well as a scathing critique of his old buddies at Goldman, who are back in the news over their role in a scheme to defraud the Malaysian government and its citizens of billions of dollars through the use of a state-owned investment fund known as 1MDB. If you want access to that conversation, as well as a transcript of the full episode along with this week's 14-page rundown, which includes an updated outline of the propaganda model and a timeline of important events in the evolution of the news business with charts and links to material referenced in my two-hour-long recording with Matt, head over to hiddenforces.io or subscribe directly through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. So with that, let's get right into my conversation with Matt Taibbi. Matt Taibbi, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thank you for having me on. I've wanted to have you on my program for a very long time. The podcast has only been around for two years, but I used to have a television show, and I had desperately wanted you on back then. I, I'm really? sure I had reached out to you, but you were, as I said, this was the period where you were financial rock star. You were writing, <laughs> <laughs> you were writing the most sort of vicious, cutting edge critiques, particularly of Gold- Goldman. You had the famous. Vampire, Vampire squid. squid. Yeah, that's going to be on my gravestone, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately. So, you know, I will get into this a little bit later because I want to start with your book, Hate INC and the Propaganda Model and Manufacturing Consent, Herman and Chomsky. 
But what was that like? It was very strange. It was totally accidental. I was covering the presidential campaign in 08. So I was on the road with Obama and McCain, too, to a lesser degree. And as the campaign was winding up or winding down, my editors assigned me a story about the causes of AIG's collapse. Right? They basically wanted me to do one hit on what happened in the crisis. And the idea was basically to do a story that Stone College kids could understand about what caused the financial crisis. We're talking about like October here? Before yeah, before is, the election? It was just before the election. When so. McCain had already gone to Washington in a panic. Yeah, exactly. Because I had already had this really weird experience of being at the Republican convention in the middle of AIG's collapse. I think it was AIG. No, it was Lehman's collapse. Lehman's collapse. And nobody in the press corps knew anything about what had caused it. I was polling everybody in the room. Like, does anybody have a clue about what any of this stuff None is? of the political reporters no, knew. We're talking like the cream of the political crop, right? Like the, <laughs> these were the top top reporters in the country. Like not one person could write a sentence that was coherent about what had happened. So I was kind of interested in that. And because I didn't want to be ignorant in writing about the crash while I was covering the campaign, I started calling people up before I got assigned that stuff. And then after the election, basically, they put me on that story. So I, I did one story about it. And what we found out is that nobody had ever tried to translate how Wall Street works for ordinary audiences. It just, there isn't a book like that. I mean, there's, you know, Liar's Poker is, mm -hmm. is a good book Michael for Lewis. people my, by Michael Lewis. But, you know, on an ordinary day-to-day -day basis, the, the financial press is for people in the business. So, you know, and we got such a response from it that I ended up on that beat for eight years after that. AIG was an interesting one because Lehman was popularized. AIG just died, like literally just died, and they just resurrected it as a dead body, that right. carcass that they just used to funnel money basically out on the insurance contracts and make sense of the mess that... Primarily Joe Cassano's unit created yeah. over at AIGFP, right? Yeah, it's like three people in London basically destroyed the universe. And he got all those bonuses oh, yeah. paid out because yeah. he, he was integral to figure out what happened. Right. He didn't have to repay anything. He's still living in this massive townhouse. He, he made something like $200 million over the course of... He was selling credit default swaps to everybody on the street and was basically Wall Street's bookie at that time. Everybody was buying swaps against subprime mortgage deals and an AIG basically their senior leadership they were all insurance people they're not financial people and they didn't really understand a lot of the derivative products that Kasana was making mm -hmm. and so when all of these other companies started asking for collateral calls like Goldman they didn't understand what was going on like the senior leadership didn't understand that they owed all this money and so AIG went into collapse and the, the whole purpose of the IG bailout was to bail out their customers and counterparties. And so that was all really interesting. That took me forever to figure it out. But what was so fascinating about it is that just no one really ever done that kind of work before. And, and it was a bizarre experience. I feel like one of the challenges, and then we'll get into it later, because like I said, I, I want to start off with your book. But I feel like one of the challenges would also be, and this just struck me now, it's hard to know what to write this as. Is it a comedy or is it a tragedy? It feels like it just sort of in limbo between those two in this Neverland. Yeah, you know? well, the whole question of approach was so central to that story because I was really, really struggling at the beginning because I don't really particularly know a whole lot about economics. I didn't study it in college. That helped you? Yeah, it did actually end up helping because I think there's a point of view issue with the story that comes into play for a lot of reporters. And finally, I ended up talking to a guy who used to work for Credit Suisse, and he sat me down and he said, your problem is you're, you're trying to understand this is an economic story. It's a crime story, right? When you get that it's a crime story, it'll make more sense to you. And, and that actually turns out to be the case, because what you find out is that most of this was about, they were making a lot of easy money basically selling really bad mortgages to institutional customers that didn't know what they were buying and that's really all it was and once you got through that it was really like a black comedy basically you yeah. know and just a whole bunch of shysters who you know and they're entertainingly loathsome people too but that was another part aspect of the story yeah so we'll get into it because i also want to maybe bring that up to date a little bit also sure but speaking of bringing up to date what you kind of have done with your book hate inc which is and you'll have to describe to me and to our audience exactly what sort of genre this falls into yeah. because you're writing it 
in real time in your releasing chapter by chapter. I've read, I've read what will end up being what percentage of the book? Probably ninety percent. Okay, so yeah. we're, I'm pretty close. The book is, as I understand it, an update to Manufacturing Consent, which is a book written by Herman and Chomsky back in 1988. Mm -hmm. Most of the people think of it as Chomsky's book. Right. It was actually Herman's idea. Herman's. That was the thing I did not realize until yeah. you interviewed Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky, of course, is the famous linguist from MIT, also a very prolific writer and a prolific thinker. You have this amazing quote in your... I don't know if I've got it here somewhere... Ah, here it is. I got to say this. So this is just, you know, because this felt so much like Noam Chomsky. Mm -hmm. uh, you wrote that uh, he has a deadpan, dry sense of humor. If you asked him to sum up all of human history, and now that I think about it, I should have done this, he would probably say something like, unsurprisingly horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and that is him. Yeah, he's very concise, and he does have a sense of humor. He's often mistaken for being somebody who's completely humorless, but actually, like a lot of people who sort of put on that front, I'll put Bill Belichick in this category too. Like, there's That's just fine. enough there that if you, you know, are paying attention, it's, it's he's actually quite funny. He's dry, he's monotone, right? But there is a sort of unrelenting honesty. Yeah, you know, and uh, with but, a tinge of absurdity yeah. too. Yeah. But that brings us back to this problem of how do you write about this sort of in between tragedy and comedy? What is it? And so, so much of what he writes about it deals with that. So yeah, so this is an update to manufacturing consent, which you read when you were shortly when you were in college or shortly out of college. You I said? was in college. I was probably eighteen or nineteen. Yeah, when was, so eighty. Right just when the book, right when the book came out. Right before. So eighty-eight, eighty-nine, something right like that. Right before the Berlin Wall fell, and after which you went to Russia, to, to Russia, mm -hmm. which is very interesting. Maybe we can talk about that as well. I read the second version, the updated edition, mm -hmm. when I was, you know, I think in my last year in college. I also found it profound mm -hmm. for many of the reasons that you laid out. I would love for you to maybe start, you know, why did you want to write this sort of a book that's a kind of an update of manufacturing consent? What did you feel needed to be updated? Well, first of all, I should back up. Like the media is so central to my life. It has been. My father is a reporter. I grew up in a family of reporters. Everybody I knew growing up was in the press. So I've been very sensitive over the years to how the business has evolved and changed. And one of the reasons that manufacturing consent was such a big deal for me was that it completely changed how I looked at something that I actually had been paying a lot of attention to my whole life. I mean, I went to work with my father from the time I was four years old. You were uh, inside of television broadcast studios, news studios in the early 70s. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. My childhood, I say this in the book, was a lot like the movie Anchorman. You know, my dad was one of those guys. He had big mutton chops and he was on TV. But Manufacturing Consent is a really eye-opening book about how we don't have direct censorship in America. There's no political commissar who comes in and red pencils your copy, you know, when you submit it. But there is there is propaganda and it's all almost all unconscious and it's bureaucratic. And what it does is you're artificially narrowing the poles of opinion by carefully monitoring who gets promoted and what kind of material gets on air and does not. And as a result, people only see a range of opinion on the big broadcast networks and in the newspapers. And that was really eye-opening to me. Like, Because I watch reporters work, I know that they're, for the most part, very honest and diligent, and they really care about their jobs. The issue is which reporters get the most space, who's getting assigned to cover what, mm -hmm. how big the headline is for X story versus Y story. All those editorial decisions are the ones that are important, and I just had never paid attention to that before. So it was fascinating, and that's why I wanted to revisit it, because, among other things, the business has changed so much since they wrote that book, because of mainly because of the Internet, but because of some other things as well. So he had five filters to his propaganda model, I believe, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah. Some of those, I look back at them, some of those don't seem to have materially changed. Right, right. Some the, of them the have. The media is still private, right? That was one of the filters, that the, the size and ownership and the fact that it's private. Yeah, exactly. And if anything, those forces have become, I think... More concentrated. More concentrated and also... There is no longer a taboo in the United States around media news as a source of profit making, right? As there used to be, for perhaps. Absolutely, that that is a big change. That's a right. huge change, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book, actually, because when he wrote Manufacturing Consent, the profit motive was far more concealed and in the background of big media. 
there was actually a taboo in the business about even interacting mm -hmm. with salespeople. Like you hear all these stories about the New Yorker, for instance, down, down the street. There was a legendary tale that almost every reporter's heard that if you were in the sales force, you weren't even allowed on the editorial floor. And that, I can confirm that. You, know, you never saw advertising people in the 70s and 80s. But then suddenly with the advent of the 24-hour news cycle and Fox and all these channels, suddenly it became a thing that was totally normal to start looking, trying to make money with news. And that radically changed everything about reporting because, you know, in the old days, the idea was we told the truth, you know, insofar as we understood it, and it was okay if we lost money because the whole idea behind the, like the original Telecommunications Act, or the Communications Act 1934, was that you lease the public airwaves in exchange for providing a public service, and that's all out the window now. So that's another big change. So CNN was founded, I think, in 1980, correct? Right, yeah. But the doors didn't really fling open until the late 80s, pretty much after Noam Chomsky wrote his book. Right, yeah, And exactly. that, a lot of that had to do also with some of the deregulation that happened in the telecommunications industry. Yeah, there was the Deregulatory Act in 1996 to the Clinton pass that, that massively opened the doors for companies to buy each other up. So we went from having like 35 major media companies in the country to six or something like that. But the CNN innovation was really important because what they originally did was basically one broadcast that they repeated 24 times or they repeated 12 times. So it wasn't traditionally what we would think of as, as 24 hour news cycle today. What they ended up doing is they ended up realizing that we can make a lot more money if we emphasize the immediacy of what we're doing, right? Mm -hmm. Like if we change things constantly. And the best way to do that, they obviously had to radically change what kind of material they covered because you can't have enough people to script 24 hours of content every day. So they started looking for stories that had visual elements or a breaking element. So like, you know, baby down a well, uh, you know, the cursed disaster. <laughs> Do babies like, even fall down wells anymore? I don't know. That used to be a thing. That used to be a thing all the time. You know, one day now massacres. It's like a, now, yeah. now it's a dog because people, we care more about animals than humans right. now. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Beached whale, or we're going to get it back in the water before it dies, that kind of thing. Those are all great news stories. And then, then they figured out that all that stuff costs money still. You still have to send a crew out, mm -hmm. even if you're renting it from AP TV or something like that. It still has production value. The production overhead was tremendous back then. It's much less today. It's expensive for legacy companies, but if we're just strictly talking about the production cost of doing competitive type media today, they've dropped tremendously. Oh, yeah, it's through the floor. There's no more, like, you know, you're not hiring union labor to do it all the time. And, you know, all the technology obviously has made it considerably easier than it used to be. You know, you used to have to have a satellite truck everywhere you went, and now, you know, you don't have to, the mm -hmm. internet's everywhere, so it's all different. But they figured out that if you don't have an action story that you can put on air, the next best thing is just to have two idiots on TV arguing with each other. Mm -hmm. And arguing is a form of action. And that became really the template for a lot of modern media was the sort of crossfire thing. And that it was crossfire that started that. When yeah. did crossfire begin? In the mid 80s. And it was probably CNN's answer to a PBS show, The McLaughlin Group. Mm -hmm. uh, Which is still on PBS, it, it, isn't it? Yeah. There's, Pat Buchanan's on that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we yeah. talked is about that. Is yeah. he on it? I've seen him on it. Wow. <laughs> I've seen him on it. He's still it's, around. He's yeah, like he's like a living fossil or he something. He's still like around. That. Yeah. He's still around. Yeah, yeah. Crossfire was the original template. And it was such a successful show because it allowed TV basically to cover the news like sports. You know, there was one side and another side. We're going to declare a winner at the end yeah. or and you're going to root for your side. And you can never, ever have the two people come to an accommodation. They're always fighting. So until next time when we start fighting again. And we train the audience to think of politics in that way. And that became, I think, you know, a lot of the template for what's mm. going on now where... It's so tribal in the way we cover mm. politics, and that was another thing I wanted to get at. Yeah, that's interesting. So this concept of framing, that it's binary, right? You, I think you called it Boolean politics. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Um, it's binary. There are two sides, and it's not a conversation. It's an argument. Right. And that's important because you're coming in as the audience, and you're primed. You're expecting something, and they simply deliver it for you time and time again. But it was still—I mean, Crossfire was— 
a very particular type of show, but CNN as a brand still carried that spirit of objectivity. Right. They're still right. It's not like it is today, but it was very much indistinguishable in terms of its objectivity from the networks at the time, right? Right, or even the language that you would read on the front page of the New York Times or the Boston Globe. It was the emotional attitude of it was distant, flat, right? We, like, they had the news voice. The news voice. There was this kind of lobotomized, like an emotional slant that you were delivering the information. And the idea there, and this is a commercial strategy, had nothing to do with ethics. The whole idea was, you know, over decades they had, they had discovered that, the, you know, the best way to get the widest possible audience was to to not have a lot of inflection when you were delivering stories so that you didn't tip off the audience how you felt about things, right? right. That was important. Because you couldn't segment the distribution. So you were exactly. distributing, it was a broadcast system. Right. So you were catching everyone. So the best way to maximize your viewership was to appeal to as many people as possible. Exactly, exactly. So you, you never could tip your hand. You tried to stay right down the middle of the road when you chose stories. This was formalized, of course, through things like the fairness standard, where you would literally quote one side and then the other, or you would do one one story that maybe leaned conservative and another story that would lean you know liberal. They tried constantly to fill the newscast, especially at the local level, with non political stories. So lots of cats and trees, lots of weather. Yeah. Right. There was a moment in the history of media where everybody used to joke in, in the local affiliates that the highest paid reporter in every city was a helicopter, right? Because that's what everybody was spending money on. Right. You would have seven minutes of weather on a 23 minute broadcast. Nowadays, you would never do that. Now it's all like this full of this politically charged rhetorical kind of discourse. And they do that intentionally because we're geeking up the audience with emotion and we want them to stay that way until they tune in the next time like which could be in you know in 10 minutes too right like the, people are watching all day long so it's a major departure from what it used to be like we used to tell audiences to calm down and not worry and then with the advent of crossfire we started this journey towards kind of winding people up for money and that's where the business started to head so what's interesting when I've looked back and thought about this because I have also on my own I've spent some time over the years just thinking about it naturally being in this business also mm -hmm. the way I see it CNN's innovation was I mean they were all of course innovations that were made possible because of technological changes and regulatory changes right mm -hmm. cable was what they piggybacked off of but as you said CNN also, there was volume. They mm -hmm. started off, you know, okay, it was one show, but they repeated it. Point is, they gave you more. Right. What I think the next innovation was, it was the same technology with cable, but what Fox did was they gave you something different. They right. changed the editorial, yep. right? That was the great insight of Roger Ailes. And that, by the way, you mentioned 1996, the, what was it, the Telecommunications Act of 1996? Mm -hmm. That was two years after the Republican Revolution in Congress with right. Gingrich. Right, yeah, the contract with America and all that, yeah. And it was the same year that Roger Ailes got hired by Rupert Murdoch to go to Fox and to build Fox News Channel. Right. I mean, so all this was sort of happening right at the same time. Yeah, and that's a fascinating period because... If you look back at Fox broadcast from that time, it's almost like the larval form of Fox. You can see the look, but they didn't quite have the take yet, right? You know, I talked to some people who worked at Fox stations, you know, like reporters. And the women there had to put shoulder pads in their, in their blouses. They had these huge chandelier earrings and the blown out hair and all that stuff. And it looked kind of trashy, but they didn't have the political slant yet, right? So Ailes, when he first came on, he vaguely had this idea that he wanted to dumb down the whole thing. But they didn't go for the outright sort of demographic stroking until tell later. Our, before you continue, tell our audience... For those who don't know, tell them a little bit about who Roger Ailes is, because most people have no clue what his background was. They don't understand his background, both in television, right. as well as his background in politics as a political operative. Yeah, so he worked for the Mike Douglas Mike show, Douglas right? Show. But he had a background also as a political speechwriter. He helped Nixon. He met Nixon on the Mike Douglas show. Yeah, exactly. And then later coached him through, I think, the 68 convention. Election. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so he was one of the first people who really understood that politics in the television age was going to be dramatically different than it had been before, that image was going to be more important than the quote-unquote ground game and all of that. Mm -hmm. He was in tune 
with the audience the same way that Nixon was in tune with what they identified as the silent majority, right? They realized that the way that Joe McGinnis, the writer, described it was Nixon was the president of every place that didn't have a bookstore, right? And uh, Roger Ailes understood that audience. He understood all those towns between big cities that had a chip on their shoulder about something, and he wanted to create a product for those people. And he even talked about it when he came onto Fox that my my audience is 55 to dead 55 to dead yeah and we're going to create a product for them and it was pretty clear what they ended up doing i mean they didn't really take off until the monica lewinsky scandal and and the 9-11 attacks and the 9-11 attack but but the lewinsky thing was really key for them because the other networks were also trying to make a sort of reality show out of that drama Mm -hmm. but fox was the first network to take sides like if you Mm -hmm. look back it's interesting MSNBC made the initial sort of major editorial decision to blow, maybe out of proportion, a story that essentially, well, at the time it was a non-story. I think if you looking back, probably there was more to it that they ignored. In the context of today's yeah, yeah, conversation the Me Too, around yeah, Me Too and or, yeah, sexual exactly. assault and things like this. But Fox went farther. Fox decided that we're going to make our buck making characters out of Clinton and out of both of the Clintons. They especially loved Hillary. They loved stories about her, and they constantly ran the tape of her talking about how she wouldn't bake cookies and everything like that because they knew that that tweaked that audience, and so that was brilliant. What's interesting is I had read, and you mentioned the neoconservatives in in your book. I had read a book. I don't remember what it was that got me down the path of wanting to uncover the history of the neoconservative movement. Few ideologies, ideological movements, think tanks, I don't even know what you would call neoconservatism but have had a greater impact on American society in a very short period of time in a key way, right? Of Mm -hmm. course, with the Iraq war and its foreign policy, I always assumed that neoconservatism was really focused on foreign policy. But when I studied it, I realized that Irving Kristol and his sort of acolytes or his compadres or whatever you would call them, that they were actually issue-driven, values-driven former Democrats, right? right who moved yeah. over to the Republican Party because of McGovern, because they felt the party had gone apeshit right. under McGovern, and they moved into the Democratic Party. Initially, it was a values-driven thing and was part of this values-driven movement. And that, of course, gets us into talk radio and how that also intersected with Fox. So it's part of this giant wave, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. They were tapping into a lot of things. There were things going on in the country that there was a kind of Democrat who had supported John F. Kennedy, um, and had been highly aggressive on the foreign policy stage. You know, the, the Kennedy was really into throwing their power internationally. The Vietnam War changed a lot of that. People came back and they had some very different ideas about how America would behave. And for the first time, we had public hearings about the behavior of the intelligence community like that. It never happened before. They had the Church Pike hearings in the 70s. And so these neocons were basically disappointed Democrats who crossed the line and and hopped on board with the Reagan revolution, which had really started with Goldwater in 64. And so they became this very powerful force in, in media later on, right? Because the problem that they had was that they weren't a, a very numerous political group. They were upper class Democrats who had a conservative vision and an aggressive foreign policy vision. But they had to somehow have a union with people, you know, sort of in flyover country America. That was sort of what Fox did. It delivered that gigantic audience into the hands of of this new political movement. And they recruited people into their movement like Dick Cheney and like Donald Rumsfeld, who were Republicans. Right. Well, they're coming back now. That's what's so interesting. Right. Is, you know, all these sort of neocon voices who they were on top of the world in 2003, like, you know, David Frum, Bill Crystal. Bill Crystal, of course. Yeah. Who's the other one I'm thinking of? Richard Pearl. Richard Pearl. I mean, Douglas Fife. Fife. Wolfowitz. Wolfowitz. Yeah, exactly. But a lot of those people are now sort of reappearing and, you know, you'll, you'll see them sort of showing up in think tanks like the Atlantic Council. And there's the merger now because of Trump. The merger now is in the other direction. They're merging now with sort of mainstream Democrats. They're going to be back in seats of power again pretty soon, which is interesting. Well, the Democrats have become very comfortable with war. They were uncomfortable with it during the Bush years, but it seems, again, like it only takes a matter of time for people to forget or to change their views. I do want to talk to you about foreign policy at some point because it's an interesting—it brings us back to something— 
we haven't talked about yet, but I want to talk about, which is worthy versus unworthy victims, mm-hmm. right, in foreign policy. Noam Chomsky famously discussed that in the context of, well, one of the examples was Cambodia and East Timor. Mm-hmm. It's a great example. But before we get to that, I want to go back to the propaganda model because we were talking about concentration and private ownership. There was something else, one of the other filters that Chomsky wrote about was advertising, and I thought about that one a bit, and I said, well, you know, still is, of course, we have advertising, but there is a a distinction. It used to be that the papers, the press, used to be much more vertically integrated, Mm -hmm. right? So, like, the content creators were also the distributors, were also the auctioneers of the ad space, the classifieds and everything else. That's been broken apart. They've yeah. ceded authority over to the platforms like Facebook yeah. and, and Google. And, How has that changed that filter? Have you thought about that at all? I have, and this is an area where I disagree a little bit with Chomsky. We had a little discussion about this because it's exactly as you say. Back in the day, newspapers, especially newspapers, had their own distribution systems. They had built them up over years. They had their own trucks. They had their own paper kids. They had their own distribution points, and that was where their power came from, right? Like if you wanted to put an ad out and try to get you know an employee and you wanted to reach everybody within a certain metropolitan area really the only best bet was a local newspaper right like you couldn't put that kind of one ad on a television show there wasn't enough ad time for that kind of thing and the only people who could get that product in everybody's hands was somebody who had that kind of distribution network when the internet came along suddenly that you've divorced distribution from content making right because the distribution is a phone line or whatever it is, a cable line Mm -hmm. now. It's digitized. It's digitized. And the distributor, you know, in 75% of cases now is a social media platform. Mm -hmm. And those people are swallowing up all the ad dollars. And so there's this huge disconnect between how much power media companies had back in the day versus how much they have now. Now they are really a step removed from the direct power over content. Mm -hmm. The social media platforms, internet platforms are really the primary powers on the scene at this point. I mean, you talk a little bit about manufacturing hate, Mm -hmm. you know, but I think this is an interesting thing to observe, which is that when the content creators who are creating the content, which is then being distributed out and which contains the advertisements for the corporations, which are the clients of the papers, when you break those apart... I think that that is a contributor to this feeding of the hate and the outrage cycle. Mm-hmm. Because the auction is separated, so the large corporations, let's say, which want social order, are not in the same level of position to shape that order. No, they're not. They have far less of a say about what the content is going to be. There are two things going on. Number one, they don't even advertise with the media companies anymore. Right. I mean, like, that's just not the way it works for the most part. Like, If you're a big advertiser, you're not going to go to let's say Rolling Stone magazine, right? Like you're you're much more likely to go to Facebook or Google. Or, or if something. you go to New York Times or something, it's for native advertising. Exactly, yeah. It has to be very specified mm-hmm. because the platforms have so much more intelligence and are so much more efficient in terms of being able to get the eyeballs that you want, mm-hmm. right? They have all that intelligence. So you're bypassing completely almost the content creators. Mm-hmm. You don't even bother to influence them. The only area where the content creator comes into play is that the internet platform has to have something to sell that you can stick the ad on top of, right? And so indirectly, you care a little bit about what that content is, but what the platforms will tell you is, we're gonna attach this to whatever turns on that target demographic that you wanna sell to. If you're a car company, you're looking for 18 to 36 year old males, you know, white males in, in the Midwest, this is the kind of content you want. And nine times out of 10, it turns out to be some kind of very politically charged content. That's the easiest way to get that audience. I'm going through these. These are the five filters that you didn't really talk about much in your book, and I want to get them out of the way. The third one was the sourcing of mass media use. That was another one that Chomsky had. I thought that was interesting, too, when I thought about it, because I think Huffington Post and the brethren of HuffPo have sort of mitigated the importance of this, I think, in the Mm -hmm. sense that it's not possible to actually make money. Again, to the point, I mean, Facebook has optimized this, but you don't need to create your own content. You can basically steal someone else's content, put some crazy headline on it, and now you it's clickbait. Right. So you don't need to actually do original reporting. If you don't need to do original reporting, it also, by impact, 
decreases the need for sourcing, right. which is this thing, and Chomsky's point about sourcing is that these corporations like CNN cultivate relationships with the CIA and former members of the military, et cetera, and that shapes their reporting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, I think, exactly the thing you're talking about right now is part of why there's been such an enormous amount of debate on the Hill in the last couple of years about fake news, because what's really going on is the intelligence agencies are very frustrated at their lack of control over, over the narrative. Over the narrative, they've lost the ability to basically get people to. They haven't lost it. They're, they're still doing quite well at it, actually, but it's just not as easy as it used to be. They don't have that direct lever that mm -hmm. they used to have. You know, in the old days, you had three networks and you had a couple of newspaper chains, and there were only a few really truly in influential voices that you had to worry about. And so if you wanted to tell people that, yeah, we were we were the good guys in Vietnam and we went in there because we were going to save a democratically elected leader who, of course, we installed, it was only a handful of people that you had to really worry about. Now, you know, with the advent of the Internet and people who had instantaneous audiences like Matt Drudge, like it's just out of their control in a way that, that is new. So they're trying to reassert control right now. They had, they had the faith of the people too, which they've lost in oh, spades. Totally, yeah. Completely. Understandably. Yeah. Understandably. Deservedly. Yeah. Deservedly. Yeah. In particular after the Iraq war. Yeah. The Iraq war and the 2008 crisis, the, mm -hmm. the bailout, the way that the Bush administration in particular with Paulson and then also Bernanke and Geithner, just the way that they hijacked the printing presses and the government account to bail themselves out and enrich themselves without serious consequence. No, I yeah. think we're living with the aftermath of that today. Oh, of course. And and that's the thing that's so frustrating. You know, having covered the 2016 election, you can see that people out there were furious and they had some real legitimate reasons to be upset. Oh, yeah. And they had, they had legitimate reasons to be distrustful of the media. I was in those crowds when Donald Trump was turning the crowds against us and saying, you know, look at those bloodsuckers, et cetera, et cetera. And that was scary. It wasn't pleasant for the press, but, you know, we kind of deserved it. Like, you know, there was a part of me that was like, you know, this is karma. We suck. But that's not understood very, it's very, like very well. It's kind of sadomasochism on the trail. Yeah. And I do want to get into that because you've been covering campaigns since when Howard Dean? You've been embedded in campaign? And, yeah. Uh, this is going to be my fifth, so. Yeah. You have many interesting stories of that. So. I just wanted to get through this for those who haven't read the book, sure, and yep. it, it's a lot of work to do this, but I think it's worthwhile. So we talked about the first three. There the, was the private, you know, sort of the ownership model, the business model, which is the ad model, and then this the sourcing, which is in order to get the information, you need to have the relationships with people. And who are those people? They are the people in the government. And so that these things are the things that filter through the information. The last two are very interesting. Mm -hmm. These are the ones you focus on, mm -hmm. which are flack mm -hmm. and organizing religion. Right. Yeah. Talk to me about the these filters and how these have changed and how they relate in the 21st century. So one is massively accelerated and one is massively decelerated, I would say. like So flack is this idea that Chomsky came up with, which is when a news organization or a reporter gets out of line when they say something that's politically unorthodox, right? Like Walter Cronkite coming back from Vietnam and saying, we're going to lose, right? Suddenly the network gets flooded with letters and back then it came usually from think tanks like freedom house and they would organize basically like primitive astroturfing campaigns to let people know that they were displeased with the coverage and this acted as a policing mechanism against certain kinds of reporters so and what ended up happening was news directors and editors learned to sort of self-censor ahead of time you can guess what kind of content is going to get you in trouble and it's going to get those letters coming. So they just started to avoid assigning that kind of reporter, that kind of story. And so flack was important back then, but now it's a thousand amplified. fold. Yeah, it's be, been amplified. It's been amplified massively by social media because now you don't have to wait for somebody to actually write a letter or have a meeting about it. Like it comes at you you know, in 50,000 tweets in, in a second if you put out something that they don't like. and It's so, also logarithmic. You don't know how bad it's going to get. It could get really bad out of control. You could lose your job. Oh, yeah. Your career could be over in 10 seconds. Right. Yeah. It's and frightening. It's, it's very frightening to be in the business right now. And especially because reporters, for the most part, in the old days, you didn't really know what reporters thought in their private lives. You didn't care, right? Like, they did their little bit two minutes a day and then they went home. Now they all have social media presences, right? And they have- they all, A lot of them have opinions and they feel like they want to share them or they need to share them. You know, I obviously do it. A lot of people voluntarily did that and now their bosses are telling them that it's mandatory, basically. Like, 
you, know, you have to go on Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter. When I first went on the campaign trail in 2004, a typical reporter was maybe doing one hit a day, right, mm-hmm. or two. So if you wrote for a newspaper, maybe you were writing one story. If you worked for a cable news network, you were doing a story that mm-hmm. would be produced and repeated. Now they're probably doing 15 to 30 pieces of content a day. So they're doing vlogs, blogs, tweets. You're more likely to make a mistake when that happens. Oh, yeah. And also, everybody knows who you are now. Like, your personality comes into play in this massive way. And it reflects upon the organization. And everybody's, you know, terrified because if you say one wrong thing, suddenly you can become, you can be in the middle of this maelstrom of horribleness Mm -hmm. that you know, can form in a second. So that's had a huge amount of impact on the business. And then what you end up seeing is that people flock to teams, right? right? So they get into crowds where the safest kind of content is saying, those people over there are bad. And you have maybe have another group on the other side that's saying the same thing about you. But the most dangerous place is to be you know, so not have a team. Not have a not team. Not be aligned. Not not be aligned. You're one of the unaligned countries right, like during yeah. the Cold War. Exactly. Exactly. And you've made a mess of both houses, a pox on both houses. It's interesting when you say that they're encouraged to. That reminded me of the case of Liz Spade at the New York Times, where she actually went on Tucker Carlson, which was probably a bad idea, even though her intentions were good. He really went after her, and he went after the New York Times. I found her to be very likable and uh, reasonable, Mm -hmm. very much so. And she expressed, I think, a reasonable disapproval towards reporters who express, who are reporters, who are not opinion writers at the New York Times, who express strong opinions on Twitter. And her view was that they probably should not be doing that. Mm -hmm. And that this conversation was after the Trump election. And Tucker Carlson was also pointing out that the headline- The headline was amazing. What was it? It was something like- How are they going to cope with this election or something? It was something like Democrats, foreign leaders, and students- prepare for Trump presidency. It was something like that. Completely once. I obviously exposed the bias that the editors had around the significance of what that election meant. Well, what they were really doing is signaling, here's who our audience is. Yeah, exactly. Right? Which is not a crime, necessarily. The problem, though, if you're a national newspaper like the New York Times. Of course. Of course, because you're you're signaling to a whole bunch of other people that, you know, we're not for you. Yeah. (laughs) Right? Which is exactly the opposite of what papers like the times used to do Mm -hmm. and that was her point her point was and it was probably only two years before that that it would have been extremely unorthodox for the times to do something like that and and for reporters to so openly take a stance and she was basically saying well this is a radical change in the business we should think about what we're doing and i don't know if it's a good idea as the ombudsman you know she was the public editor right she was the public editor of the new york times yeah but she was drummed out of the business for saying that. <laughs> for basically looking like she had she had jumped ship. Right. Which is horrible. Horrible that that, it's so tribal and so primitive. It's yeah. very primitive. It's like something you would expect from a chimpanzee troop. So in one sense, I can understand that that doesn't concern you, right? You've never been aligned in that way. I've said to you that you- Well, s- no. I mean, it's dangerous for me. I mean- Well, this is what I wanted to ask you. So yeah. I do have a question though, because your writing style is very combative, right? Mm-hmm. You take no prisoners. Does that not concern you today, the way that you write? Does that not worry you? Yeah. Oh, I mean, my life is not simple now because I always made it a point to go after both sides. And I would consciously try to pick stories that were sort of institutional in nature, bipartisan, right? Like I figured most of the overlooked problems would be... A strong populist. There was always a strong populist undertone to your writing. Yeah. I mean, I think the press... When we're doing our jobs best, we probably are trying to represent people who have less power, right? So the press is, it counteracts the power that sort of institutionally- Punching up, yeah, punching punch, up. Punching up, right. So you want to sort of look at things from the point of view of like ordinary people. But now there's a very, very strong pressure out there to jump on board with narratives. And whereas- not that long ago, it was considered a virtue for a reporter. Like right after Obama got elected, I did a story about how Barack Obama had chosen Wall Streeters, Wall Streeters to, from mostly from Citigroup to run his economic policy, and it was very critical of Barack Obama. Even though you know I I had voted for Barack Obama, but at the time people were like, "Well, that's really salutary, right? Like that's what a reporter should be doing." And now, if you do something like that now, 
there are people who are real and people who are not real on social media who will swarm all over you and make your life difficult. And that's why there's fewer people doing that now. How has that impacted your willingness to do that? I definitely think about it more than I used to. I mean, I used to sort of reflexively just sort of go wherever, you know, stories led. Now I do think twice about what the impact is going to be before I write any, any story because <laughs> it can be extremely unpleasant. So I think you have to save your bullets for the best and most important arguments now. It's just so much harder to reach. Do you resent the fact that you've had to censor yourself like this? I mean, a, a little bit, but I've had it easy before then. I think, you know, other reporters in other countries obviously have a much more difficult time than I do. I lived in Russia for a long time where people were getting killed for, you know, mm -hmm. they, they actually had to take a real risk. Now I'm basically risking money, which is, you know, not a, not that big a deal. Another interesting point, though, there that then we'll get to it that, again, I imagine that the reporters who are risking their lives well, what are you talking about? You're talking about under the Putin regime or I was going to make both, the, actually. both. Well, I was going to make the point that I imagine that those who were risking their lives during the period where the United States was very close with Russia during the transition after the fall of the wall, those would have been deemed unworthy victims. Exactly. First, yeah. By, yeah. By today's standards, Khashoggi is a worthy victim. Right. In the modern narrative, no one would say that his murder is less valuable, but they would say that other murders are. Right. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, if you were to ask anybody who lived through the 90s and the early 2000s in Russia, they would tell you that actually probably more journalists got killed in the 90s than under the Putin regime. Now, that doesn't mean it wasn't dangerous to be a reporter under Putin. It was. And it was also more overtly political with Putin that you were much more likely to be killed by a gangster than by somebody associated with the government in the 90s. But there were people who were associated with Yeltsin who were murdering journalists left and right in the 90s. And they didn't really appear in the news. That was one of the first things that I really noticed. I mean, I was young back then. I didn't really know what I was doing. But I thought it was very odd that here we were promoting democracy and freedom. And, you know, we were supposed to be on the side of the angels and everything. And there were reporters getting blown up by exploding briefcases. And, you know, we weren't raising a fuss about it. It was very strange. But of course, you had read Noam Chomsky's book by then, so you sure. had some idea. <laughs> I had some idea, and clearly, you know, we were so heavily invested in Boris Yeltsin, Democrat, that right. narrative that you know, just that anything that counteracted that that just didn't show up in the news. Well, I mean, one of the most iconic images of that period was Boris Yeltsin standing next to Bill Clinton, smiling, laughing, joking, on the White House lawn. Right, oh, that's of one of those iconic images from you know, if you were to make a collage of the 1990s. So that brings us to organizing religion. That's right. the fifth filter that Chomsky has. It's a powerful filter. During the Cold War, it was the filter was anti-communism, anti -communism, right? Yeah. And of course, we had McCarthy, McCarthyism, right? So powerful examples of that in practice and reasons to be afraid if you're a reporter or anyone really. I think under the Bush years, it became this anti-terrorism, anti right? Anti-terrorism, yeah. What is it today? Well, now there's Russia is a foe, right? So you don't want to be called a Putin bot or whatever a the Putin term. Putin apologist. Yeah, Putin or apologist, something. yeah, exactly. A denialist. That's bad. And there's a sort of a cousin to that, which is like a fellow traveler. And I think you'll see what happened with Tulsi Gabbard last week. I wanted to ask you about her because yeah. she's catching a lot of flack and I'm just flack. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. She's yeah. catching a lot of that's what flack is and I I mean she seems so reasonable. Well, look, there's I don't know much about her and I haven't studied the the candidates. I know Elizabeth Warren because she's been around forever and I've been in this finance for a long time so sure. I'm very familiar with her. Sure. This upcoming democratic primary, you know, there's so much at stake. There's a tremendous amount of fear that Bernie Sanders is going to win the nomination. And part of this is wrapped up in the idea that, you know, some people genuinely are afraid that that's going to result in Trump getting reelected, you know, because because Sanders will be the next McGovern, right? That's right. the logic or or he'll be the next Mondale. But a lot of it has to do with people who are the political donors in this country are reading the writing on the wall and, and they are understanding that there's this huge amount of discontent out there and that people want different kinds of policies right they're frustrated with wealth inequality there's a lot of there's a lot of anger directed towards billionaires mm -hmm. and they're trying to tamp that down as much as possible that kind of leveling 
redistributionist kind of politics. They're not willing to make the concessions necessary. It brings us back to 2008. The wealth transfer during that period was enormous. Oh, yeah. They papered it over through asset price appreciation, but the cracks are still there and they're getting amplified. And I think the volatility that was dampened in financial markets after 2008 and the the Fed intervention and the intervention of the government are showing up in our politics. That volatility is showing up at the electoral box. Absolutely. And people aren't stupid. They saw that, okay, I lost my house and 40% of my net worth or whatever it was after the crash, and nobody bailed me out, but these idiots who did this- In broad know, daylight. In we, bro- we, we did, broad I did daylight. a show recently where this sort of came to me, and it came to me in the middle of the conversation. I remembered that they had put Neil Kashkari in charge of TARP. And TARP, yeah, the a guy Goldman from person. Goldman Sachs. Yeah, and he we, was like eight years old or something yeah, like that. He yeah, looked like, he looked so young. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> and then he, like all these people, went and started chopping wood for like 10 years, right? He like yeah, went he on a farm. Yeah, grew a beard. They he all grew, grew beards. They all, they all, <laughs> but now he's back. He's the Fed. Right, yeah. It's outrageous. It's totally insane. Yeah, and then they're all totally out of touch. They don't know how bad it looks either. That's another thing that's amazing to me. Like, you know, because if you actually talk to a lot of these people they'll say well who else would you do you want to put in charge of this somebody who doesn't understand this stuff like okay we get that you understand it but you also massively screwed up the whole situation and people are mad about it right they've lost value in their homes they're being foreclosed on and you you know that whole thing was completely full of fraud the you know the foreclosure fraud all that and there was no consequence and then so people are furious about that stuff and it continues to reverberate through Trumpism, through through other movements. I mean, I think the Sanders movement is sort of like the opposite reflection of that. And they're determined to prevent any outbreak of that in the Democratic side. So I think Warren, Gabbard, and Sanders are going to get a lot of heat from the traditional commercial media. Uh, because Warren and Sanders are sort of anti-Wall Street, seen as anti-Wall Street, and Gabbard is anti-war. Anti-war, she's exactly. Heavily, she's getting, catching a lot of flack for somehow being a, a Syrian apologist, as if our policies of intervening in the Middle East have actually made the world better. No, they've been a disaster. Disaster. How much better would things have been if we hadn't invaded Iraq? It's remarkable that the people that were advocating for these policies, they're still out there advocating today. And they have no clue how this plays out there, right? Right. Like, I mean, exactly. it's, it's people, you know, they're sending their kids to the Middle East. And a lot of reporters, we, when we've been to the Middle East, we've been on these deployments. These are good kids, right? They're trying to be patriotic. They're trying to do what they're told. And then all of a sudden, they're put in these terrible positions, right? Like, you know, they got to shoot somebody. They don't even know what, what it's about. They're piloting drones that are crossing borders. And, you know, they're being told to pull the trigger on somebody because some algorithm tells them that they have to. Like, this stuff is damaging. That's why... You know, you go to those neighborhoods where a lot of veterans are returning home. Those are the places that are the reddest of the red states right now. And also, Matt, I mean, you ever watch these commercials that the military puts Oh, my God. It's like video games. It's like video games. Yeah. That's amazing. They They go to video game conventions. They thought about this a long time. They target them. They target these young, in particular, like testosterone-fueled males, right? Right Right when they're hopped up, I can do anything. Yep. Exactly. And they say, oh, this is going to be exciting. You're going to get to you know, play with these cool toys and it's going to be just like a video game. And it's going to be an adventure. You know, you're, you're going to hide behind the wall and the bad guy is going to be, you know, it's going to be like Fortnite, right? Like everybody thinks that's what it is. Then they go over there and it's completely confusing. You have no idea why you're there. Everybody hates you, right? And they have reasons to hate you, you know, and you don't get those until you've been there for a while. And I think it's a very disillusioning experience for a lot of the people. And they come back, and again, the people who are in power, they just discount word of mouth how that works. You know, like the, our military deployments overseas are just not popular. When people come home, they don't sing the praises of those adventures, no. you know. and A lot of them are damaged emotionally, if not physically. Yeah. I suppose physically, not as much as they used to be. Remember, we were taking a lot of casualties, and a lot of people were getting injured during that period where. Before and after the surge. Right, yeah, Remember? exactly, yeah. This reminded me of George Carlin. Mm-hmm. George Carlin's great bit about, well, first of all, we love war, Americans love war. Why? Because we're good at it. Right. But also, he made the point about how, I think he was speaking about Republicans, but this, I think, applies to both parties, but it applies particularly to Republicans because they have right to life advocacy is part of the plank. And he said, you know, Republicans 
They don't want you to die. I forget how he said it. He's like, you know, they care about you as long as you're in the womb. When they get out, they don't give a shit about you. And then when you turn 18, <laughs> they want you to go to war and die. Right. Yeah, you know exactly. I mean? That's right. That's right. You know, yeah. and, and that got me thinking, this is sort of the thought process. It got me thinking about comedy. Right. It got me thinking about, again, this tension between comedy and tragedy. And then it got me thinking about something that you wrote in your book, which I wrote down here as actually the, the top quote at the very top of this rundown, because I thought it was interesting. And this is probably a good segue, and then we'll, we'll follow through to the rest of this rundown. You wrote, as news reporting becomes more politicized, more negativistic, less trustworthy, and generally more of a headache to digest, people increasingly are going to turn to narrative as a source of information. Before you wrote that, you made a point about Jon Stewart and this revolution in comedy that happened around the Bush years where comedy became a vehicle for truth mm -hmm. at a time where the news media was failing that job, that obligation. What you're saying now is that we're moving to this place where narrative becomes a source of information. I'm curious, what did you mean by that? I mean, I think I was talking about that, that people are going to get their information from movies, from Netflix series, from videos. Why do you think that is? Like, what is it? And what's an example maybe of something where you think people are getting their information? And is the quality of information as good because they're getting it from narrative how does it compare to like let's say what john stewart did because i look back when john stewart was doing his bits i used to think that's brilliant he's communicating or when colbert is going to the white house and roasting bush he's communicating something important to the rest of us but i also wonder if something isn't lost by using humor or wasn't lost by using humor that needed to be delivered seriously and so i asked that also in the context of your point about narrative well of course something's lost when you uh, are, and when you do comedy, because there's a limit to how much you can inform people that way, because the driving message of all comedy is, you know, don't take life too seriously, right? Like, everything is absurd. Ultimately, we're all going to die, and that sucks, and, you know, <laughs> let's laugh about it, right? Mm. Like, that's at the root of comedy. But if you're asking somebody to take something seriously, you can't make a joke about it. Mm. You know, there's a limit to how much right, you can make. Exactly. Can, right, exactly. That's so, true. So what Stewart did, I think, was incredibly important and cool. What was so great about it is that he went after both sides and he mm -hmm. was pretty ruthless about it. And he, I actually think he was funnier in a way about the Democrats than he was about the Republicans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like he, he nailed this sort of pretension on that side that was really interesting. But it instantly becomes not funny when it becomes partisan, right? So that's what Saturday Night Live to me is totally unfunny now, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, I agree. Colbert, too. I cannot watch Stephen Colbert's late night show because it's completely one-sided. And it's... Jimmy which, Kimmel's funny because he whacks both sides. He, yeah, exactly. And Colbert, which is disappointing because his, his show... Used to be great. Used to be really funny in, yeah. you know, in that respect. But you have to have some place for people to go where they can get, you know, depend on getting the straight dope about things. And yeah. there's just, where do you go now? I don't know. Like, I'm a news consumer myself, and I'm very frustrated podcasts. right now. Yeah, podcasts, you know, there exactly. Are, in all honesty, there are certain people, I mean, they're not perfect, but like, I used to have a conflicted sort of relationship with Sam Harris, but I found him to be a valuable source of information because he brings an intellectual honesty. He's not perfect, mm -hmm. but there is an intellectual honesty to his view and an openness and a willingness to be vulnerable to someone else's counter argument. Mm -hmm. You know, he's mm -hmm. not in a position to just attack the other person, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's always value in somebody who tells you exactly who they are and what their opinions mm -hmm. are because that it rings truer than somebody who pretends to have no opinion, like an anchor, a traditional anchor man, right. right? Like they're actually hiding biases that way, right? But also they have tremendous power. You know, the, Tucker Carlson's a great example. I mm -hmm. mean, Tucker Carlson brings people on his program, and he's not alone. I'm just picking him as a good example. He brings them on, and it's framed. I mean, he's got so much power in that framing, mm -hmm. and he just starts berating them, mm -hmm. right? And like, it's not a conversation, it's a scolding. Yeah. Right, no, and that's what, that's what Rachel Maddow will do in all these other anchors as well, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. No, I mean, and Tucker Carlson doesn't bring people on to win. With or to learn. He doesn't <laughs> yeah, want to learn. He doesn't, he doesn't want, want to learn, learn either. Yeah, exactly. He brings people on to, have to deliver a message that he wants to deliver, <laughs> and he's going to look good doing it. And the only way that people should go on that show is if they understand what they're getting into and they know what the end result is going to be. Bill O'Reilly was the first person to really do that exceptionally well, right? 
I think Carlson's better at it than Bill is. I mean, the, Tucker Carlson's more condescending than anyone else I've seen. He's condescending. He's quick. He's uh, quick-witted, yeah. Whereas, you know, Bill O'Reilly is is kind of a C plus mind. You know, I mean, I think <laughs> he's another Boston person. I you know I grew up around people who worked with him, and he, you know, he had a shtick. He didn't deviate it from it very much, and he was still kind of a phony, right? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. what Bill O'Reilly was trying to sell was, oh, I'm a, I'm a man of the people. Uh, you know, right. I. I'm one of these guys who, you know, hangs out in Patchogue, Long Island, and, you know, I could play pickup or whatever it is. And he's not. Rich he became dude. a rich dude who pretended not to be one, and yeah, it, did, yeah. it didn't go over very well. Tucker Carlson doesn't hide who he is, yeah. and I think that goes over better on he's TV. He's also a better writer, and that comes across, and he has some – some of his monologues are good, but they always, for me, they kind of spin off a little bit. I want to close off one thing before we move on about organizing religions because I thought about this, and it wasn't clear to me what – was, let's say, the organizing religion of today. But there is one that comes to my mind and something that we've covered on the program, one with time with Jonathan Haidt on his book, The mm-hmm. Coddling of the American Mind. Another time we had Robbie Suave on after the events that happened at the Lincoln Memorial with the Covington Catholic School oh, yeah. kids and the Native American veteran. This white oppression this sort of anti-white oppression as an organizing religion. I don't know that there is one dominant religion like there was anti-terrorism or anti-communism, but this this is a very powerful one that has emerged. And I want to take a quote for you because I think it's really interesting. And I was actually tweeting about this before Kamala Harris tweeted it out because I was basically thinking like, you know, how does this integrate with American foreign policy? And she wrote, Russia was able to influence our elections because they figured out that racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, and transphobia are America's Achilles heel. By the way, transphobia was not even a thing 10 years ago. I don't know how many people even knew it was something that they would even be afraid of. Right, yeah. Are America's Achilles heel. These issues aren't only civil rights. They're also a matter of national security. We have to deal with that. So I have a question. Given everything you know, everything you've read, given what we've been talking about, given this thing about organizing religion, about flack, how does that fit in? This is a very dangerous topic. I think one of the things about this sort of new movement with, you know, it's intersectionality, right? Like that's the word everybody's we've, using. We've covered that on the show. People yeah. know what that is. Yeah. Our listeners so, know what that is. So it's a sort of campus intellectual movement that probably would not have broken out of, you know, sort of academia in the way that it has, except that I think when it becomes interesting is when somebody who's already in power decides to sort of appropriate an ideology. And I think what we've seen in recent years is that since Trump came to power, you've seen like the mainstream of the Democratic Party and some of the sort of never Trumpers on the Republican side have sort of drape themselves in some of those themes. You know, it doesn't mean that they're not legitimate, right? But it's begun to become kind of an organizing political theme. It's not in the same way as maybe anti-communism was once upon a time. That encompassed all aspects of society, communism or anti-communism, yeah, right? Exactly. The war against communism. Right. Because there was a nation state and everything else. It couldn't possibly sort of be that way. But it's got this sort of civil war quality to it. Right. There was a huge amount of resentment, certainly from Trump voters in 2016 that I found from people who, you know, there was an amazing moment in the campaign where Trump was actually plummeting in the polls. It was in August of 2016. And Bannon sent him out on this tour around the country to start talking about how he was going to be the savior of the African-American community, right? I remember that. So bizarre. It That's was, interesting. It was so Bannon weird, Bannon sent right? him out to do that, huh? Yeah, Bannon <laughs> sent him out to do that. that was, Bannon became the campaign manager, right. right? He does this. He sends Trump on this tour. I was I was on that tour. It was so weird. So this uh, is after he replaced Manafort, right after he replaced Manafort? Exactly, exactly. And he starts giving these speeches how, oh, you know, I care so much about the African-American. And what that was really about was he was trying to recapture a segment of the vote that needed psychological permission to vote for him. Initially, a lot of Republicans felt that Trump was too racist to vote for, but they also hated being labeled as racist for being Republicans, right? And so there were a lot of people who were torn, right? I felt like that made him look more racist. 
when he it did, did that. It did to us, <laughs> but I think to a lot of Republican voters, they were trying to justify to themselves. They were trying to say, hey, I want to express my anger over being painted right. a racist, yeah. right? And here's somebody who who really does care. <laughs> I mean, it was transparently ridiculous, it seemed at the time. But my point is that this theme is so charged in American society right now for people on all sides. And there's a huge amount of resentment out there among people who feel like they're being painted as transphobic, homophobic, racist, white supremacist, all those things. Is it an organizing religion? It's certainly something that people don't want to be on the wrong side of now. Well, well, most certainly not. It also fits very nicely into this worthy versus unworthy victim system, right? We talk about intersectionality. Intersectionality is a sort of hierarchy of victimhood, which is born out of these sort of nonlinear relationships between groups that intersect. There are clearly, within this narrative, there are clearly worthy victims, there are unworthy victims, and it's showing up everywhere. Now we're dealing with it, of course, in Virginia. It's the latest state where the governor was in a picture where he says it wasn't him now, but that's, I don't know if it was him or wasn't him. Regardless, it's on his Facebook page of him, either him in blackface or wearing a Ku Klux Klan hood. His deputy governor or lieutenant governor is embroiled in a sexual assault scandal. The attorney general is in it also. So this is like, you know, it's sort of consuming the society in all sorts of different ways. Anyway, I think it's an interesting one because it shows up and Camilla Harris had that tweet and I thought I thought it was also interesting. It's something that we've covered. Just, yeah. just, just to get to that for a moment. I mean, I, I think most Americans have similar feelings about racism, sexism, you know, all of those things. What's dangerous is when it becomes such a common political tactic. I mean, I think right now there's a tendency to say, well, if you're against this politician, you're racist, you're white supremacist. I mean, that, that happened with the Bernie Sanders campaign. And that was very damaging to that campaign, I think. Uh, I remember the, that. The, the whole Bernie bro movement, everything. And so... There's two different things going on. There's the real narrative of racial oppression, which is a very powerful central part of the American story mm -hmm. and is unresolved, clearly, right? Then there's the other thing where I think that there are people who are using some of those words for political purposes. So I, of course. I, I, I think we're dealing with two different things. I mean, I wrote a whole book about the police killing Eric Garner and mm -hmm. you know that's like been a huge part of my career is writing about police brutality and things like that well the massive injustice incarceration, and incarceration rate, the, 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 the drug differing war. outcomes and in, in the criminal justice system all those things are just huge unresolved issues but I think that's separate from what there's a rhetorical aspect to this that's going to pop up in the 2020 presidential race that is different from the historical narrative, which well, is going to be interesting. That's so scary. The same problem happens in climate change. We talked about it. We had the head of climate science at NASA, Gavin Schmidt, on the program. And this was another point of the conversation, which is when something is real and there's a substantive part that you need a conversation for, when it becomes politicized, it destroys everything. Right. But, you know, to this point about, you mentioned Bernie Sanders, what about during the 2008 Clinton-Obama campaign where, where Bill Clinton got labeled a racist for, I think it was him or it was, I think it was him, for saying something about comparing Obama to Jesse Jackson or something like that? But point is, I mean, look, these guys are politicians. They know how to operate. But, you know, well, that was some stuff that was before the South Carolina primary. And it, it was intentional. Th th well, there was some stuff going on there that was kind of traditionally subtle politics. Like you know, there was a thing that Hillary said about how Martin Luther King was great, but he needed a president to get things done. Like it's not. No, that's it, interesting. It's, I didn't, it's I didn't not hear necessarily that like she racial is it racial politics? It's, well, that it is kind of racist because what's the comparison between MLK and Obama? Zero. Yeah. Other no, than their it, skin color. There's no relationship it between was the two. just, you know, it's a certain kind of messaging that was going on during that campaign. I think everybody was aware of it. There was the leaking of a picture of Obama in a dashiki. And the, right? the Jeremiah Wright stuff. That the was, that was Wright heavily stuff, racist. You know, so the race played a huge part in that campaign. It was very bitter. It was very ugly. Like both the Democratic primary and the general, and the general election. Election. yeah so you know I, I don't know about 
Bill Clinton specifically, but that was a very political. I just charge. remember when James Carville was out there. He's like, that man doesn't have a racist bone. I can't do it. Can you do his accent? <laughs> no, I can't. I can't. I've met him. Doesn't have yeah. a racist bone in his body. <laughs> bone, something like that. But you know, of course, remember, like during the Bush years, anything that was anti-Israel was immediately anti-Semitic. So right. that that is used constantly. This is nothing new. You know what I mean? Yeah, so no, it's, this it's, is it's happening right all now the time. With, with the Omar thing. You know, the APAC issue. You know what's interesting though? I was listening to a New York Times reporter. Her last name is Barry, I think. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. But she was making the point, and I didn't know this was happening, but somehow within this construct of worthy versus unworthy victims, American Jews and Israelis have sort of lost some of that power mm -hmm. that they had mm -hmm. in the narrative earlier. She was making this point. She was on Joe Rogan's show, which you were on mm -hmm. recently. I'm gonna, I wanted to ask you what that was like. But I, I think that's interesting, and again, it fits into this point, which is that there's a substantive reality, mm -hmm. right? And, I mean, of all things in the world, the case of Israel and Palestine, where could you find more nuance? Right. Right? You'd be hard pressed to find a world where there's more nuance, where you need less sort of grandstanding, right? Yeah. Because you've got a real problem. It's not going to be solved with grandstanding. You know what I mean? I've actually gotten in trouble for saying that I don't like to talk about Israel and Palestine because I've never covered it, right? Like, I think that's a prime example of a story that you can only do <laughs> if you're yeah. if you're deeply in the middle of it and committed to the long game of looking at all sides of it, right? right. Because it's so filled with subtleties and difficulties you know the problem with modern media is that you know in the twitter age we've reduced a lot of things that are extremely complex to you know a few characters and that always reduces things to the dumbest form of politics and it's been a very negative thing and it it's especially dangerous when you start getting race and nationality and you know patriotism and all those other things involved then it gets more dangerous well that also brings up something else that you wrote about in hate inc which is not only that everyone's got an opinion but you better have one you need to have right. one the worst thing i think this is that quote i have from you here the, the two most taboo lines in all media in america are i don't know and i don't care right yeah exactly it's one of the biggest deceptions on television. A million years ago, I got invited to go on CNN for some panel show, and I think it had to do with finance I was being asked on. This is before you went through your career change? No, it was just after that. So just it was probably that. like 09 or something like okay. that. So I get asked on, and then at the end of the segment, they asked me a question about Syria or something, or some Middle Eastern thing that had just happened. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, oh, well, I don't cover that. I don't know. You know, right. I, like I, I literally just stared in the camera and said, I can't answer that question. I don't know anything about it. And I was never invited on again because that doesn't happen on television. You can't admit that your knowledge base is not like, you know, a million miles deep. Whereas the reality is, you know, and I wrote about this, look at Wolf Blitzer's Jeopardy performance. Like these guys don't know anything for the most part. They mm -hmm. just read what's in front of them. And it's a huge deception that we know everything that we're all knowing. Actually, we, we learned this stuff 10 minutes ago. And the other thing about not caring is we can never, ever imply that the news isn't the most important thing in your life. Mm. Whereas the reality is we should tell people pretty regularly, hey, you know, spend more time with your kids. You know what I mean? Like well, smile or, you know. Well, as you've said, it's bad for you. It's like smoking. Yeah, exactly. Um, we're going to go to the overtime soon, Matt, where I want to talk to you about the Goldman scandal get back to this point about the financial crisis and some more about politics, but I want to close off because I wanted the full episode to really be a focus on media, mm -hmm. and I think we've done a good job of going through the propaganda model and sort of updating it along the lines of your book. There's one other thing that I want to talk about because my experience in media, I was blogging right before and during the financial crisis when you were writing as well, and I had a radio show on 91.5 here in New York, and then I had the opportunity to create a television show, which I was able to produce on the RT network. Mm -hmm. So this was mm -hmm. a fascinating experience for me because I was sort of in this subversive group, right? right? I could never have done a financial program, which is what my show was, Capital Account, if I didn't do it on the RT network, which right. had no corporate sponsors. And it was a great show and it wasn't any shilling. And it was not, of course, I didn't talk about Russia. And I caught flack for ever mentioning China in a negative way. Uh -huh. So that was something I had to learn. Obviously, I knew about Russia. But other, other than that, you know, we didn't talk about politics. So I think it was a valuable show. And so that gave me an appreciation for networks like RT, Right. Like Press TV, like Al Jazeera, sure. um, and some of these non-aligned networks, you know, like the non-aligned nations. Yeah. This is something I wanted to talk to you about because we were talking about sort of the evolution of media. We mentioned CNN, we mentioned Fox. Those are both children of the technology of cable and sort of culturally impacted by what was going on in the Republican Party, talk radio, et cetera. And then the internet, it disrupted first 
the press, you know, mm-hmm. newspapers through classifieds, Craigslist, Monster.com, et cetera. Yeah. And then YouTube was really a watershed for the broadcast cable industry where all of a sudden you had, I mean, the, the craziest cases, of course, are like Alex Jones. Right. right. Yeah. But you had this revolution in media to now where you've got guys like Joe Rogan, you were on Joe's show. I have no idea. Maybe you can tell us how many millions of oh, it's unbelievable. And listeners. Yeah. He's like CBS. Yeah, exactly. He's a one man CBS, basically. The reaction to being on on his show compared to being on any of the big three networks is there's no comparison. That's to. remarkable. Yeah, no, that's it, so remarkable. That is just mind blowing because it's literally just this. Yeah, and like shitty cameras, shitty lighting, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's not going to tell you it's not. That's part of the appeal. Right. It's just like a guy who used to host Fear Factor as a comedian, you know, is like a fighter hosts UFC program sort of an everyday Joe yep. and his name is Joe and they got more viewers than like any of the networks. Absolutely. And and what's so interesting about that is the networks still have no clue how little they matter to ordinary people. They still think that you know what they say not only has importance but resonates, right? And they don't get that people hate them like yeah. to you know not just like a little bit but like you know to an extraordinary degree and personalities like joe you're absolutely right it's the low tech setup it's the intimacy of you know who i am you can see all my flaws like there's not yeah, exactly. makeup covering everything you know what i mean like i make mistakes when i give my interviews sometimes i don't know what i'm talking about now i'm a I'll dummy admit, yeah i'll admit it you know this is for informational purposes, you know, bring people on. The conversations are sometimes good. They sometimes go off in tangents. All of that resonates with people a lot more than the intensely produced segments that you get on network television. And I constantly struggle with this because I work in this business and I'm dealing with people who just don't see, you know, especially with the political campaign, like the presidential campaign, they just don't see how... They turn people off. Well, you're right in Hate INC. Everyone seems to hate the media. Nobody in the media seems to understand why. Mm -hmm. And then you proceed to explain. We won't won't get into that here. I bring this up also because I I think a lot about this. I mean, I started this show because... So I I had a brain tumor and I had developed dementia after my... Which is why I had sort of ended my work in television. And I sort of took some years off as a result of that. And during that time, I put on a conference in New York and I also created a theater company, started putting on off-Broadway productions, but I always wanted to get back into this. Mm -hmm. So I started going to meetups around New York City because I used to work in tech before I got into any of this stuff in video games and on the technology side of application development side of television. And I was kind of looking at some of these emerging technologies that I was interested in, like AR, VR, and then ed tech too. And I started thinking about what is the future of news? Because I I did miss this stuff, you know? Mm And I started this show because, first of all, I see these media companies as being multimedia now, right? Like Mm -hmm. Vox is a good example. Vox doesn't differentiate between the print and the podcast and the videos. And increasingly, they're all part of the same thing. Yeah, you have to do that now if you're one of those companies. Well, you know, I have my own ideas about where media is going or could go. But the last question I wanted to ask you for the episode is, you know, what do you see as the future of media? Where is this medium going? What is the future I think there's going to be an enormous showdown coming. There's going to be a moment in time where we're going to have to decide whether there's going to be some kind of Orwellian faucet (laughs) that people in power are going to get to exercise over all media or whether we're going to have a system of Joe Rogan's being the, the influential messengers of society, right? Because we've already seen that people in government are incredibly frustrated at the situation right now. And every time that the internet has looked like it's this big democratizing force, there's been a wave of reaction. And now, you know, we're seeing, you know, I think it began really with wiping out Alex Jones, right? But How do you feel about the decision? I I, think we could both agree that he's nuts. I think we had an existing system to deal with people like Alex Jones. It didn't work very well in his case, right? Like the whole idea is if you do what he did, and I think the things that he said about the families were libelous, right? But we had a system to deal with with bad speech that was extraordinarily effective, but it was intentionally slow, Mm -hmm. right? Like we 
erred on the side of not censoring, right? For a long time, we had this court-based system that sort of weeded out people who did bad things on the air. This new system, where there's a couple of choke points with internet platforms, and we can just sort of zap people, exactly, is extremely dangerous. And, Scary. And people have no idea how bad that can be. Like the thing that was really scary about the Alex Jones thing was the coordination, right? It yeah. wasn't, it was all of a sudden five or six of them at once deciding. Now, if that becomes formalized, right? And there's some kind of a procedure, because you already have a hidden regulation system with media, right? Like if you do a Google search for whatever, it doesn't matter. Like the great example is Trotskyism. Mm -hmm. What will come up will be a New York Times article about Trotsky or something like that. Whereas the leading Trotskyist site in the world, the World Socialist website, will be like 200th, right? So they're already making decisions about content yeah. that you see. But if they can directly remove obnoxious content and there's only a few platforms, the potential for, you know, a kind of 1984 situation is very scary. So that's what I worry about. I think we're going to have a moment where we're going to have to decide, is that going to happen or not? That's an enormous, it's too much power. In fact, I was telling you that I'm in the midst of reading Shoshana Zuboff's book. She's going to be my next guest after you, Surveillance Capitalism. It deals exactly with this. this uh -huh, uh -huh. And I think, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's tremendously scary and it's something that needs to be dealt with. Matt, thank you so much for spending so much time in the episode. Oh, Stick thank around. Thank you, Dimitri. Yeah, and we should mention, if you want to read the book, it's at taibi.substack.com. Absolutely. In fact, I'm sorry. I'm glad you mentioned that. No, that's okay. Uh, also, give out your Twitter handle, Matt. It's at mtaibi, so it's at M-T-A-I-B-B-I. -B -B -I. And what is Substack again for people that don't Substack know? Substack is this cool little platform that allows sort of independent writers to, it's like an email newsletter service. So I'm serializing the book. It's going to come out in physical form later this year, but doing it as I go. And so you can get most of the chapters already and you all you have to do is to subscribe. And so right now, most of the book is already online. I co-wrote another book with a drug dealer last year that's online there as well. That's but, a really cool story. And you're also Matt Taibbi. You're a rock star. We didn't have a chance. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about when you and Jeremy Scahill and Glenn Greenwald got together and created The Intercept, or I don't know exactly who came first, when. Yeah, they but, were first, yeah. Right, but it made sense. I mean, it made sense to all of us. The three of you kind of made sense. Mm -hmm. And it's because I think you're all subversive. You're not part of the herd you know you differentiate so in that sense you're a bit of a rock star so it's always good to follow uh, oh. rock star journalists who write interesting things well thank you that's i don't know they're more rock starry than me for for sure that's uh, that i think i would say but thank you so much for having me on dimitri it's been fun thank you matt and that was my episode with matt taibbi i want to thank matt for being on my program today's episode of hidden forces was recorded at creative media design studios in new york city for more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.